Good morning, church, and welcome. We're so glad you could join us online for this Sunday morning service. Why not use our new chat function to let us know who you are and where you're watching from? We also have a prayer request function and have a team stood by ready to pray for you. We hope you have an amazing Sunday, and I pray that this service blesses you. It's a call to arms. A call to disarm. Lay down your sword and pick up your staff. Because pacifist never meant passive. Jesus' love has never been passive. Serving the poor could never be passive. And he was the one who showed us how. Roll back 2,000 years. Sweat, tears. Pain, a choice. He felt. He hurt. He gave. He chose love. love. And what do you choose? What do you choose? Because love is a choice and we all have to make it. And pain is inevitable in this journey of faith. And all that we have is all that he asks for this task we've been given. Are the poor worth saving? Are the dirty worth seeing? Are they worth the time, the pain, the irritating conversations, the ups, the downs, the undulations? The people who want help but just won't help themselves, are they worth it? Were we worth it? Boldly to say enough is enough, just as he said, that's enough. That's enough, oppression, poverty, self-inflation. That's enough, ignoring the needs of a nation. That woman with two pennies gave everything she had. What does that mean? What does it look like? It looks like a man with ten quid donated by a friend saying, I'm going to bring all this injustice to an end. It looks like faith whilst in fear, faith on a cliff top. It looks like I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I'm doing it anyway. And Jesus knew fear. 
Was it enough to die? Is it enough to live? Are we going to be the kind of people who say we love Jesus, but turn a blind eye to the people who need us? Seeing the pain and saying, that's enough. Salt and light. Light and love. He said, I came to set fire to the world. Let's light it up. That world which is your street. Your neighborhood, your people. That world which hides the need, the suffering, the shame. We're not kicking down doors, we're opening them up. With a spirit not of fear, but of power and love. We're speaking up to defend the rights of the poor and needy. For the poor will be raised from the dust and lifted. If you feed the hungry and take care of the oppressed, then your light will shine in the darkness. I know that the Lord secures justice for the poor and upholds the cause of the needy. And are we not his instruments? We, his instruments, his chain cutters, those that debt takes hostage, God sets free. And on the day that it counts, the king will say, whatever you did for one of the least of these, you did for me. It's time for change, and we have the power. But change comes in many forms. Slow and steady, like an oak tree growing. Loud and dramatic, like a volcano. Like a revolution. It, it ebbs, ebbs and flows, it builds and it breaks, it, breaks. it, it is and it does, but what it shows. shows is that that was enough. Well, good morning and welcome to our usual Sunday morning service. It's a real privilege just to have a few moments to speak to you today. I thought it was really important for us to acknowledge that um, today is Andy's last service, as was indeed Melanie's two weeks ago. And it is a real sadness really that we'll be losing them from our circuit and that we've not really had a good opportunity to say goodbye to them. Uh, if things had been normal, then we would have been meeting together and really thanking God and praising God for all that uh, he has done through them in the life of the former North and South circuits and uh, as now in the Lincoln circuit. So we do want to send them with our blessing. Uh, we want to pray that God will continue to inspire them and guide them in their ministries. We want to pray that God will be with them as they make their moves to their um, new circuits, Andy to Norfolk and Melanie to Kendall, and as they take up superintendencies. And uh, we just pray that those new circuits will be blessed by their ministry. Uh, but above all, we, we just thank God for their time with us. And uh, if you want to share your appreciation this morning, maybe you might put a comment in the chat this morning to say thank you to them. Or maybe you want to get in touch with them personally and just say thank you for what they have done. But uh, thank you for listening and thank you for being with us today. And I pray that God will bless us as we worship together. Amen. Good morning, church, and welcome. We're so glad you could join us online for this Sunday morning service. Why not use our new chat function to let us know who you are and where you're watching from? We also have a prayer request function and have a team stood by ready to pray for you. We hope you have an amazing Sunday and I pray that this service blesses you.
Good morning. Welcome to the Lincoln Circuit online service. If you're joining us in real time, Sunday the 26th of July, then it really is good morning. <clears throat> if you are catching up later, you are equally welcome. And I trust and pray we will all be blessed as we worship and give thanks to the living God. Although we may be physically distanced, we are genuinely together before God who transcends time and space and we worship him as one as we join in with or reflect upon the words of our first hymn before the throne of God above. Incredible truth. What a great reminder and a joy as we commence our worship together. Because the sinless Saviour died, my sinful soul is counted free. Let us pray in the light and knowledge of that truth. Lord God, 
We thank you for the forgiveness that is found in Christ Jesus and in him alone. We come before you now and remember that your word says, if anyone is in Christ, the new crea creation has come. The old has gone. We depend upon you and you alone for our forgiveness, our redemption, our restoration and the work of change you are currently doing in our lives. We thank you for all that has already been done through you and we open ourselves for all you still have for us in the future. Amen. Let's say together the Lord's Prayer. The contemporary version is in your service notes if you want to pray with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I'm now going to share with you our first reading from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. And I'm beginning at chapter 40, verse 1. You do have Bibles on screen or access to them if you want to follow that. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says, the, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low, the rough ground shall become level. The rugged places are plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. With all the issues around travelling, safe countries, air bridges, quarantine, and so forth, you may be surprised that we're about to travel around 3,000 miles southeast and we're about to travel 2650 years back in time as we meet our host Isaiah. Enjoy your trip. It has been almost 200 years since the end of the golden age. Saul our first king then the mighty king David followed by his son the wise temple builder, Solomon. We had said, we want a king like any other nation. God spoke to Samuel and said, I'm their distinctiveness. I'm their glory. They'll regret choosing this path, but it is their choice. They are rejecting me. He was right. God always is. Arguments over taxes, demands from the king, use of our sons in his standing army, all the usual beefs of other nations, plus issues over where and how to worship, caused a seismic split. The promised land became the divided kingdom. Tribe fell out with tribe, neighbour with neighbour. United we stood. Divided, we were heading for a mighty fall. Who are you for? Was the question on everyone's lips. Israel in the north or Judah centred on Jerusalem. <laughs> I was on the high ground, literally as well as spiritually. My ancestry placed me firmly in the southern kingdom along with others from the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. But first and foremost, I wanted to say, 
I'm on God's side. But that didn't seem to be on the answer sheet. It was the year my cousin died, or to give him his official title, the King Uzziah. We were both grandsons of King Joash. I never knew the old king, but I remembered I, I remembered Uzziah with fondness. I'd been born and brought up during his reign. I was accustomed to walking the royal corridors. This had been a good reign. Overall, after decades of warding off the nations around us, King Uzziah was fortunate, or should I say blessed, to be on the throne when times were a bit easier. To the south, Egypt, that former superpower, the place of our earlier slavery, was fading fast and no longer a real threat. Things had changed to the north as well. Beyond the borders of Canaan, our land, the old powers had fallen and the emerging powers of Assyria, Babylonia, were not yet the forces they would become. So the constant procession of foreign warmongers through our neighbourhood had eased off and we'd become more stable and more prosperous for now. Although we were slow to thank God for that, gave ourselves the credit. Now, if you don't know the geography of our land, you may be puzzled by my comment about everyone tramping through it. The God who made this pleasant land in which we live chose well, naturally, a relatively narrow coastal strip of land sweeping up from the Mediterranean on one flank to the impressive city of Jerusalem on the other. South took you to Egypt, Africa. North to the emerging superpowers, I've mentioned them already, and to the trading highways of the silk and the spice routes, or across the land bridge or the seas to the lands beyond. We are the crossroads of the world, the trade routes, the melting pot, the home of all nations. Call it what you want. But that means it's a place of extreme military and, signif and significant strategic importance as well. If they're not fighting for our land, they're fighting on it. The death of my cousin was important. But that year of my life was changed by something far greater. Let me tell you. No, let me read it to you. After all, I was there. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they called to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, the whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I am ruined, I cried. I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he'd taken with tongs from the altar. When it touched my mouth, he said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. Send me. 
Isaiah was about 17 when this encounter took place. Only a teenager. It's incredible, but by no means a unique account. The tale of someone experiencing the tangible presence and glory of God. In this atmosphere of the divine and holy, Isaiah's first response was to be acutely aware of his sinfulness. Think how it was for Adam and Eve when they hid. But God's desire is to maintain relationship rather than to turn Isaiah away from the intense radiance of his presence. An angel comes and touches his lips with a hot coal, burning away both sin and guilt. It says in verse 7, as we read, Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Incredible words. And aren't they words that give a wonderful picture of the work, the future work of Christ? Here is the work of the cross foreshadowed. To quote the hymn, Isaiah had been ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. If you read further, you will see that as for you and me, Isaiah's redemption is not restricted. I use that word advisedly. is not restricted to the restorative work of God, but is also a call to change, a call to follow, to serve and to draw near. The first words spoken from those burnt lips by Isaiah were, here I am, send me. That remained Isaiah's response for the next 50 plus years across the reign of five kings. Isaiah is believed to have been martyred during the early part of the reign of Manasseh, around about 687 BC which means he was less than 10 years older than I am now when he was killed. Much of this book was probably written during his imprisonment. The nature of his death, according to contemporary rabbis and church fathers, was one of those listed in Hebrews 11, the chapter of faith. Let me read what it says there. That some were put to death by stoning. Not Isaiah. Some were killed by the sword. Not Isaiah. Some were sawn in two. Isaiah. What, what a way to die after over 50 years of faithful service. From Isaiah's commissioning onwards, from the age of 17, he spoke the words God gave him, words of warning and judgment against the rebellious people of Judah, words the people ignored, rejected, reacted badly to. He learned, if you want to hear the voice of God, and you need to hear it to share it, if you want to hear the voice of God, and grow in his service and in his image, you need to draw closer. You need to spend more time in his presence. The significance of the reading we had from Isaiah 40 is that this is the spot in the book where the commentators and the scholars gather to fight. For around two and a half thousand years, the, sen the consensus was that the whole book was written by Isaiah during his lifetime. Recently, by which I mean the last 150 years or so, some have argued for multiple writers over a much longer period of time. Why have they said that? Simply because they reject prophecy. In other words, God foretelling future events and giving that information 
to someone who is one of his people to a prophet so they argue that if prophecy can't happen the portions about exile must have been written after the Babylonian captivity 50 to 60 years after Manasseh died which would have made Isaiah about 130 if he hadn't been sworn to death earlier so it's an example of trying to make scripture fit with human understanding or logic always a dangerous path to follow funnily enough though these same scholars still see the passages about the suffering servant later on in Isaiah was speaking about my Messiah Jesus 600 years later so no consistency there in their argument as for me I'm confident the eternal all-knowing all-seeing God who knows the end from the beginning spoke to his servant Isaiah and Isaiah listened if you look at an overview of the book chapters 1 to 39 predominantly speak to Judah of impending judgment and separation as a consequence of sinfulness and rebellion remember these are outcomes brought through sin they're not what God desires his desire is for return for reconciliation the red flags of warning are motivated by God's love and protection for us. Now, the people didn't believe the prophetic warnings at first, but it became much more credible when the Assyrians conquered and took the, na the next door neighbouring northern kingdom of Israel captive. Judah realised we could be next, but they still didn't repent. They still didn't return. When we get to chapter 40, that begins to identify three future horizons. One which is about captivity and exile. That's the first one. And then two more beyond that. So defeat and exile was about 80 to 100 years in the future. Chapter 40, which begins with those wonderful words, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, is about redemption and return. Another 70 to 160 years beyond that. And the reason those gaps are so wide is because actually that exile took place in three or four tranches and return took place over the reign of a number of kings over a similar period of time. <clears throat> so first of the three, exile. Second, return to Israel. Third, a future hope. Glory and the Messiah, fully realised in the person of Jesus Christ, around 700 years on. How could they be so sure these would happen? Well, if you look back at chapter 40 that we've just read, the final words I read were, they knew because the mouth of the Lord had spoken. A word that comes from God is a word that can be trusted. He is always faithful and he never fails in his promises. Before we leave those verses, let's just pause and speak. Think for a minute. God speaks comfort and love. He speaks tenderness to those in need. And he makes this very strange to our ears quote of their debt having been paid. How is that possible? Well, it refers to she, and that means Jerusalem, his people. And it says they had received double from the hands of the Lord. So we know it's the Lord who has made the payment, paid the debt of sin for the rebel. But what's this double portion? about from God's hand 
Imagine this. Someone has a large bill to pay. They argue, they dispute, but to no avail, it's theirs and it's due. On the due date, they turn up at the payment office with a wheelbarrow filled with copper coins. The exact sum, not a penny more. He tips them out on the steps. Take your money, he says. And he leaves the scene stingily, begrudgingly, still angry, arguing to the last. That's not how our God deals with things. Our God pays a debt which is not his, but ours. He pays a debt that, unlike the man, we could never pay. He pays it in advance. We just need to accept the payment. And he pays it not to the penny, not to the penny, but extravagantly, joyfully, abundantly, unendingly. He doesn't do just enough to get us over the line of forgiveness, even though that would be more than glorious. He provides more than we ask, more than we could imagine, more than we would ever believe, so that we can become his people, but also become the people we were meant to be. Living in fellowship, growing in his love and power forever. We've been taken from below the breadline to sit at the banqueting table. We've received double from the hand of God. Let's reflect on all he has done as we sing a traditional hymn which declares the eternal truth. Jesus paid it all. <laughs>
words wonderful truth Jesus paid it all and with God all means all hard to take in but truth indeed we're going to carry on looking at Isaiah just for a few minutes more there is some homework because I'm going to go through some of the bullet points quite quickly and I'd encourage you to go back and look and pray and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal more to you. Well, let's have a look. We've already seen wonderful truths from the book of Isaiah. It's no wonder that commentators refer to it as the gospel of the Old Testament. Isaiah mirrors God's displeasure of sin and also foreshadows hope. The book lays foundational promises for God's faithful people. The greatest hope being the certain assurance of a Messiah, bringing salvation not just to the remnant, but to the world through them. So Isaiah, whose very name means Yahweh, the Lord, his salvation, reveals God's plan, purpose and passion. And they're all focused around us throughout. We've seen from the scripture already today, from the dealings with Isaiah and Judah, a God who meets with us, who forgives us and purifies us, who invites us into his service and partnership with him, who speaks to us and through us, who desires us to draw near to him in relationship and as we draw near, who changes us and transforms us, giving us a certain hope and a future. A God who can be trusted in all things. Tim Keller speaks about it as, in terms of relationships as being a God who wants to be known to us as father, friend, beloved and king. When I was first preparing for this service and the genesis of it was back in Lent, not even walk down there was just one verse that sprang out to me i'm going to look at that now plus some further surrounding context so i'm going to read to you still from chapter 40 but beginning at verse 10 see the sovereign lord comes with power he rules with a mighty arm see his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him he tends his flock like a shepherd he gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Did you spot the references through that to hands and arms? We've already seen one reference in the first reading to hands and arms when it says that God paid our debt from his hand is where the recompense came, it says. So we know that God, the God we see in the first few verses, is the giver of amazing grace for all. 
blessing upon blessing. In the last verse we just saw, it talks about a God who holds and measures the waters of the earth in the hollow of his hand. Can you imagine? Amazon. No, let's get bigger. Pacific. How will that do? Biggest body of water on earth. Just in one hand, Atlantic in the other. I'll pour this into where the land needs to receive it. It's the mighty hand of God in another way, isn't it? The mighty creator. If you're interested, Pacific is 160 billion square kilometres. Big hands, safe hands. He is the mighty creator as well as the amazing giver. Thirdly, in verse 10, it speaks about one who rules with a mighty arm. We have a picture here of a warrior king. A warrior against sin, against rebellion, against evil, against all the things that put themselves up in opposition to God. A mighty God who has lost and will lose none of his battles. He is all conquering. A mighty warrior king. And then verse 11, that verse, a God described as our shepherd who gathers the lambs and carries them close to his heart. A God who is tender, a God who is intimate, a God who holds us so close we can feel his warmth and protection. I'm reminded of um, Corrie Ten Boom when she was ill and she wanted to get back to serving God in the front line. And she heard the voice of God say to her, Corrie, don't wrestle, nestle. We all need that place of safety, that place of intimacy, that place of protection. Let me tell you some of the characteristics of the shepherd, the good shepherd. I've mainly picked these up from Psalm 23, which you will be very familiar with, and also from John chapter 10. So, if you want to check more out about them, that's where to go and look. The characteristics of the Good Shepherd are he knows his sheep, knows them well. He protects his sheep from all danger. They are his own sheep, not just looking after them. He's not just minding them for someone. He's not disinterested of his own. He speaks to him, to them, and they know and respond to his voice. He feeds them. He leads them to the good pastures. The safe places. He provides for them in other ways. He's the one who takes the ticks out of their fur. He's the one who unravels their wool from the hedge of thorns when they're ca caught. He's the one who cares for them in every way. He bears them up, carries them. We've seen two pictures of that, the lost sheep where he's carry carrying the lost one on his shoulders. And here the one where he's carrying one close to his heart. He shows compassion, love, tenderness, goodness. 
He leads them. That's both from and to. He leads them from the places where they were, which were often not good places or safe places, and he leads them to the place of redemption, the place of glory, the place of heaven, the place of being together forever. And in doing that, he loses none. He loses none that have turned to him. And as we've heard, and I keep coming back to this image, he holds them close to his heart. You and me. You and me. You might think, well, it says he does that for the lambs, but actually we're all lambs. There are, all, there are times when each one of us is frightened, uncertain, confused, in need of guidance, weary, lost, or just wanting to be closer. And he offers that to all of us. No one accepted. No one accepted. If you were counting, I gave you 11 points. Now, it's very unusual for a preacher to give you an odd number unless it's three. Do you know why? It's because the 12th point is an individual point. The 12th point is you. Where do you fit in at this time? The Good Shepherd, Jesus, calls us into relationship. He calls us to be his relation sheep. Someone had to say it. He calls us to follow him and only him. God doesn't do social distancing. He says, draw near. Remember, I said before, Isaiah learned if you want to hear the voice of God and if you want to grow in his image and his service, you need to draw close. Closer. And you need to spend more time in his presence. Those are two of the things I've been trying to do during lockdown. It's not too late now. Draw near, draw close, spend time. What if you what if you sat there thinking, I'm not sure I've met my saviour. I'm not sure if I've joined the flock and become his. If you're thinking that, it's not too late. Today. Is the best time there is to put that line. If you're thinking, yes, I know I'm part of his flock, then rejoice. Either way, in these times of global and personal turmoil, of change, of confusion, of uncertainty and physical lack, a time of pressure, where is safer? and more secure than in the arms of the faithful one. For each of us, now is the time to draw closer still. The time to move in, to hear his voice, to experience the peace he alone can give and to renew our desire to serve him more fully and become more like him. A time where, like the beloved disciple John, we can rest our head on his chest, close to his heart. It's a time for new beginnings, not to look back, but to move on. God calls each of us to a deeper faith, a growth in holiness. It is our lifelong journey. There's always more to discover. On this adventure, he will never leave you, never forsake you, 
never let you go. Let us declare these truths and our response. In that song we have just sung, that in response to all that we have received at God's hand, we will give him everything. Is that our intention this morning? Is that what we mean? We thank God for his blessings 
and his continuing faithfulness. Now, from this morning, it may well be that some questions have arisen in your mind. If you are thinking about following Jesus for the first time, or if you've decided to do so, or if you're uncertain about the next steps in your personal journey, then please let me encourage you to either speak to a Christian you know who can help you, or to look out for the contact details at the end of this <laughs> service so that you can email and ask one of us a question and we'll do all we can to answer and help you in that. So as we're coming to a close, we're going to pray now. So let's pray. Can I ask that wherever you are, just close your eyes and try and picture that image of the shepherd, gently but securely carrying the lamb close to his heart. It doesn't struggle or try to get free because both by instinct and experience, it knows this is the safest place to be. With the shepherd, no harm will come. Protection is certain. Healing and peace flow. Provision is given. Yesterday, including its sins and failures, is gone. And tomorrow is secure. Realise that you are that lamb. Holy Spirit, I invite you, as the music plays, please minister to each one of us your lambs draw us closer and help us to receive from you close to you never let me go I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm your friend you are my desire will do 
Cause nothing else could take your place To feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find a way Bring me back to you Thank you. 